There's only two religions in the world. Either God is God or man is God. It all boils down into one of those two categories. That is also a reflection of two attitudes. Either you are going to have an attitude like Jesus Christ had, or you're going to have an attitude like Lucifer has, like Satan has. That's what it really boils down to. Let's look at the two attitudes. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, all right? Those of you who do not have a Bible, if you did not bring a Bible, just uh, read my lips as we read silently the verse together. (laughs) I'll read it out loud. This is the New International Version. (laughs) Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. That's what I'm really harping on tonight. Who, being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now, would you please bear in mind that Jesus, who was and is God, humbled himself and became a man? That was very nice of him to do that, considering that most people today are trying to become God. The perfect opposite. See, you got two attitudes there. But what's this other attitude? Where did it come from? What's it like? Well, let's go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verse 12. This is one of those passages that talks about the fall of Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart... Now, before we get into this, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, what do we pray? We say, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. Good attitude. What does Lucifer say? I will ascend to heaven. I'm going to be the head honcho of heaven. (laughs) The (laughs) HHH. I don't imagine he even got past God's first secretary, you know. Bing, hello there, I'm the HHH now, you know. Whoop. He got found out, down to earth he went. Now he's moping, he's pouting, he's fuming, stomping around on the earth. Boy, that God, what a sour person he is. Kicks me out of heaven just because I want to be God. I mean, who does God think he is? God? <laughs> I'm going to get God. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. Then he's, he's probably walking around in the Garden of Eden, you know, and he hears this voice. Oh, Adam, supper time. <laughs> Makes his way through the garden, and he looks, aha, he looks upon the apple of God's eye, the joy of God's creation. The center of God's purpose he looks upon mankind. <laughs> you've seen two, you've seen them all. And there they are. <laughs> I have a plan. <laughs> you know, God, being totally just, had to kick me out of his presence when I rebelled, when I wanted to do my own thing, when I wanted to be God. (laughs) If I can get mankind to buy into that same lie, if I can get mankind to assert himself and try to be God and be rebellious, God, being perfectly just, will have to kick him out of his presence and kick man out of the Garden of Eden. It's a beautiful plan. He goes to his closet. He's got to have just the right outfit. Oh, wolf in sheep's clothing. No, 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 no. Ah, snake. (laughs) He gets on his snake suit there and he wriggles into the garden. Get into that garden there. How's the conversation? Uh, well, Genesis chapter 3. We need to look this up. Genesis chapter 3. We go now to the conversation between Eve and the serpents, now in progress. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree 
in the garden. I mean, really, Eve, let's be open-minded about this. Let's think this through. Did he really say that? How do you know what God really said? I mean, after all, it's been translated so many times it can't possibly be accurate anymore. <laughs> let's shed doubt on God's word, all right? Well, Eve, I don't know, she'd been to Sunday school or something. She had it down. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, quote, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Unquote. <laughs> you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. In other words, Eve, if you eat that fruit, your eyes will be opened. You will have an altered, higher state of consciousness. You will see things you've never seen before. You'll have truth and reality you've never experienced before. You'll be able to make your own universe, call your own shots, make your own rules. You'll be able to judge for yourself what is right and what is wrong. You will be the ultimate arbiter of all truth and all morality. Oh, what a package. All you've got to do is eat the fruit. So Eve thought about it. Well, okay. <laughs> and she ate the fruit. No, it's not the fruit. It's the fact that they ate the fruit. The fact that at a heart level they decided, I want to go for that. I want to do my own thing, have my own way, call my own shots, make my own rules. I want to be God. Who can pass that up? Well, none of us ever did, you know. It's kind of, a, it's called sin. <laughs> the Bible says, as in Adam, all die. You know, we all inherited that. You know, the humanists try to tell us that actually man is perfect. He is pure. He is born a clean slate. It's only society and poverty and ignorance and social injustice that makes him bad. We all know that. We all have to teach our kids how to be selfish. We have to teach our kids how to be rebellious, you know. Son, son, you're obeying me again. Listen, you know what? Don't, don't obey me so much. Oh, it's that basic attitude, and we've all kind of inherited that. It's part of being human. We have it in our hearts. I, me, 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 I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. Some of us never grow out of that. Instead of growing out of it, we turn it into a, a religion, and we spiritualize it. And that's kind of what we see happening in a very obvious way in our society today. You see, look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. It's a profound statement by Samuel. Uh, you know, there's a whole context here of how King Saul disobeyed the Lord and so forth, and the prophet Samuel is scolding him. Uh, and, you know, he can read the whole thing to get the context, but this one key element here that Samuel says is very important for any society to remember. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, he says, For rebellion is like the sin of divination. Some of your Bibles probably say witchcraft. And arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. Samuel was telling Saul, Saul, don't you feel like you're so holy. Don't think you're any better than all those witches that you've driven out of the land because at a heart level, you're no better than they are. You've rebelled against God. You've asserted your own will over that of God and you are expressing a rebellion against God that is the same stuff that the witches are into. And so... That's really interesting. Let me draw a line for you. This will kind of clarify it a little more for you. I call this the line of rebellion. There, here's the line. There's five points on the line. Five kind of steps toward that. You start at this end of the line. Let's start with a basic rebellion. Let's start with the idea that there's no God. I'm not going to have God running my life and telling me what to do. I want to do my own thing. You know what that is? That's humanism. Humanism is the basic idea that man is the center and the measure of all things. Oh, that feels so sweet for a while. You're going along, you're saying, ha ha, there's no God. It's me, just me, just me in this universe. Ha ha, I'm all alone in this universe. Ha ha. And then it begins to sneak up on you. Ooh, I'm all alone in this universe. <laughs> and you start to wonder, what am I even doing in this universe? 
Why am I here? Where am I going? Who cares? Oh, we work on that real hard as a society. We raise our kids that way. Kids, welcome to Biology 101. The first thing you need to learn is that you are an accident. <laughs> you are a totally meaningless conglomeration of molecules that came together purely by chance billions and billions of years ago. Kind of the dust and the gas of the universe kind of floated around and finally bumped into each other. And then, it's, then he said, I know. Let's be organic, okay? And so they became organic, and they kind of came together, and they formed little gooey things, and little gooey things floated around in the primordial soup for a couple million years, and they, you know, they grew little flippers and fins, and they kind of grew legs and crawled up on the land, and then they started getting fur and feathers and started eating bugs and all this other stuff, and they kind of became bigger creatures and started roaring around, and they kind of started walking upright, became a monkey, and then they kind of became an ape, and then the ape decided to shave, and so he shaved, and, and uh, you know... And he became, you know, an evolutionist is what he became. It's kind of like from goo to you by way of the zoo. <laughs> and as, as such kids, as such kids, you, <laughs> you're really an accident. You have absolutely no reason for being here. Your life is meaningless. And when you leave, you're only so much compost. <laughs> so... Oh, class dismissed. Okay, well, head on down the hall now, kids, to that new class they're starting this week, that class all about self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our society has a way of shooting itself in the foot sometimes. We work so hard to take away our kids' ultimate sense of meaning, purpose, value. I don't really have any reason for being here. I'm an accident. I'm meaningless. Second notch on the line is the idea, I'm going to find more to myself. There's all kinds of different ways to do it. You can go to India and contemplate your navel and things like that. <laughs> you, can, you can enroll in a, in a motivational course at, your, at the company where you work, or you can get into this, what man can conceive, he can achieve. So you get involved in all that stuff. But you know, when you really get into this human potential, I'm going to find it somewhere. You know, it, you... You end up over here in new age occultism. It becomes something spiritual. The idea, yes, we're actually divine. <laughs> you know, the new agers will tell you that. Our problem is ignorance. We're all God. We just forgot that we were God. That's some kind of God that forgets that he's God. <laughs> and what good is that going to do? You remember your God if you forget it again. But oh, we're actually all divine. There's this divine potential in every one of us. We just have to discover our higher self. And so they get into the crystals and the, and the tarot cards and the higher self and the meditation. They do all that stuff because they are looking after trying to find that human potential that is actually something spiritual. But when you get into real heavy New Age occultism, you're actually uh, dealing with spiritual beings out there. You know, they're into channeling and so forth. This channeler goes into, goes into some trance, and then this spirit enters their body, speaks through them, begins to tell them all kinds of neat. You're getting into an area over here where you're actually starting to mess around with demonic spirits. Now you're into witchcraft. Witchcraft. What is witchcraft? Well, witchcraft is seeking after power. The goal of witchcraft is power. White magic, black magic, it doesn't matter. You're after power. Power over other people. Power over your situation. Power to manipulate reality. Power to be, as it were, God. So you tap into the natural forces. You tap into the spiritual forces through spells, potions, incantations, lighting candles, doing all these different things. You get yourself a few familiar spirits, these spirit guides that come and help you out. Or manipulate you or use you until you get into such bondage that you cannot escape it. And then you end up over here at the last step on the line. And that's what we hear so much about today. And that is Satanism. Satanism. Well, that's naturally the way we're going. We want to do what Satan wanted to do in the very beginning. I want to run my own show, do my own thing. And now Satan is coming along and saying, I'll help you. I'll give you all the power you need. And whoop, here we go. This is where man ends up. This is where our young people are ending up. We started over here by telling them, young person, you're nothing but an accident. There are no absolutes. There are no absolute morals. No one has any right to tell you what to believe or what to do. So go ahead, do whatever you want. Boom, this is where they're ending up. Because rebellion is as the sin 
of witchcraft. And when we as a society decided that we were going to throw out the God in whom we're supposed to trust, we basically signed up for a whole lot of trouble as our whole society began to slip down this line. It's red flags time now. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's see, who would have turned to that? 1 Timothy chapter 4. The scripture says, the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Now, in the original language, that means deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Well, we used to kind of slough over that a little bit, you know. Yeah, doctrines of demons, yeah, sure, you know, all these cults and things, weird guys coming up. No, these are doctrines that are actually taught by real personal demons who are speaking to people today, who are talking through them, who are manipulating Ouija boards and crystals and tarot cards, who are actually causing doctrines to be taught all around this planet. Now, the big religion, of course, is that man is God. Come on, do your own thing. Have your own way. There are five doctrines that can lead you to that conclusion. I'll give them to you. Number one, the first doctrine is truth is relative. Truth is relative. What does that mean? Well, that means that there is no ultimate truth. Whatever you want to believe, that's true. (laughs) We're going to be real relativistic. We're going to be tolerant. We're going to be, we are the world. We are children. We're all going to get along because nobody really knows anything for sure. So believe whatever you want and it's right for you. You see, we've got an opinion-oriented society. Now, we used to say, well, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. Yeah, that's true. But that doesn't mean that everybody's opinion is just as good as everybody else's. It is possible to be wrong. But we don't seem to like, we don't go for that in our society anymore. We don't want to say anybody's wrong. Well, let me tell you, you're going to be a relativist. A relativist believes three things. (laughs) Number one, you have to believe that nothing is true. It's true. (laughs) The second thing you need to believe is that nothing is knowable. In other words, you can't know anything for sure. Nothing. I'm sure of that. (laughs) The third thing, you have to believe that nothing matters. I don't care what it is. It don't matter. Well, think about it. Imagine I'm raising my kid. I say, kid, nothing is true. And I don't know anything, and neither will you, and neither one of us ever will. (laughs) Oh, you know, we can make up something. Go ahead, make up something. Your opinion is just as good as mine. So what are you left with, really, ultimately, when you get to the end of it? You're left with me. So go out there into that meaningless, pointless, chaotic universe and try to make the best of your life. Maybe you can come up with some reality that will make you feel good, but I haven't got anything to offer you. Those kids are in big trouble, aren't they? When you know the Lord... When you know the transcendent, personal, loving God, you've got something that you can carry with you and pass on to your children. Something they can be sure of. Solid ground that they can walk on. I was on the radio some time ago. It was a really dumb radio thing. It was a five-minute interview during the commute hour. And here's Chris Brecher, she's the DJ, she's doing the, the news, the sports, the weather, the traffic report, she's going a mile a minute, and she says, well, we have Frank Peretti with us, he's here, he's an author, he's written a book called uh, This Present uh, Darkness or something like that, and uh, he's here, and I haven't read the book, I don't know anything about the book, I don't know anything about him, but he's here for an interview, so let's talk to him. Frank, what's the book about? And I said, well, it's, it's about five minutes. Uh, well, 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 the book's about uh, angels and demons and spiritual warfare and good and evil and saints of God caught in the middle, she says, ah, you don't really believe that, do you? <laughs> Oh, she was a good interviewer. It really made you feel comfortable. You know, I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. I do believe that because the Bible says that there are angels and demons and good and evil and spiritual warfare. And she says, are you ready? She says, listen to this. She says, well, how do I know that what you're saying is true? And I had a beautiful answer for her. Two days later. <laughs> I 
I did all right. I, I answered the question pretty well, but this is the way I should have answered it. I should have said, Chris, there's no way for you to know whether what I'm telling you is true unless you know what the truth is. And there's no way for you to know what the truth is unless there is a truth that you can know. <laughs> now digest that for a while. saying, you know, the New Agers are out there calling themselves, I'm searching for truth. What do you mean you're searching for truth? There is no truth. And you say you're searching for truth. What are you looking for? It doesn't exist. You've got to have a truth that is true whether you believe it or not. Boom. It's true whether you like it or not. Boom. It's true whether you even know about it or not. Boom. It's just true. <laughs> objective external truth that stands in and of itself. The Bible talks all about that. From cover to cover it talks about the truth. And the Lord says, I am the Lord thy God. I declare what is true. I declare what is right. Jesus said, he is the way, the truth, and the life. As a matter of fact, he told Pilate, I came to bear witness of the truth. And Pilate came back and said, what is truth? I don't know what truth is. What are you talking about? Well, let's go to the next one. Truth is relative. That, that's the first one. The idea, well, I, you know, I'll make up my own universe. You can't do it, people. There is a truth you are going to run smack dab into, and you're going to get a busted nose sooner or later. Let's go to the second one, though. The second one is God is impersonal. God is impersonal. That's the idea that, well, boy, you know, I don't want a God who's a person. If God were a person, then that means, oh, he probably has a moral value system. He probably expects his whole creation to abide by his moral value system. And that means, no, 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 I don't want God to be a person. I'd rather, but you know, it'd be neat to have all that power, though. It'd be neat to have all that Force, that vibration, that mm, it'd be nice to be able to tap into that universal energy without it really having any personality. That way I get to pull the strings. I can tap into this energy and I can make it do what I want it to do by meditation, by incantations, by chanting, by all kinds of interesting things. So instead of believing in a personal God, they believe in a force, an energy, a vibration, a consciousness. A power. You got this whole idea out there. Uh, the, the, the New Age movement and, the, and, and secularism and so forth are experience oriented. We used to say, if it feels good, do it. Now we say, if it feels good, believe it. <laughs> whether or not something makes you feel good is no criterion for determining whether or not it is true. But that gets us back into the first one. I'm talking about the force, right? The universal consciousness, the energy, you know, the crystals. That's what that's all about. But they believe that these crystals are antennae that draw psychic energy. And so if you have these crystals in your car or in your home, ooh, all this stuff is focused in. That's why they wear it on their person, because they believe, you know, they're going to draw this psychic energy. Shirley MacLaine, you know, a lot of New Agers are moving up to the Pacific Northwest. And one of the reasons is that they believe that, that Mount Rainier is a conduit of psychic energy. They want to be under the spout where the mpa comes out. <laughs> God is, God is impersonal. There's no personal God. There's just this energy. That may, takes many, many forms, many different ideas. Let's go to the third one, and that is all is one. Now, the first one was truth is relative. The second one is God is impersonal. The third one is all is one. The idea, you know, the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is God, and the creation is the creation. They're two separate things. I'm awfully glad for that. Because this universe is in trouble. It's corrupt. It's given over to sin. It's stumbling over its own feet. It needs help from the outside. And I'm glad there is an eternal, transcendent, personal God who can reach in from the outside and pull us out of our predicament. That's called salvation. But, you know, if you don't want to serve God, if you don't want to believe that there is a God to whom you are accountable, there's, there are two ways you can get rid of him. Number one, you can make everything God. Or number two, you can make nothing God. In other words, in secularism and naturalism and materialism, they just believe the cosmos is all that there is and all that ever will be. 
the idea that there is no God at all. But in this religious sense, they take God and they make God everything that is. That way God isn't separate from his creation. God is the creation. The mountains are God. The skies are God. The wind is God. The sun is God. The platform is God. The podium is God. I'm God. You're God. Everything is God. But that's why Shirley MacLaine stands on the seashore there and she's saying, I am God. And she's trying to convince herself, I am God. And her teacher is sitting there saying, come on, you've got to really believe it. You've got to just shout it out. And she says, I am God. I can imagine the infinite, eternal God of the universe looking down on this. You know, compared to the size of God and the size of his universe, uh, Shirley MacLaine isn't really that much bigger than the grains of sand that she's standing on. Here's God listening to this voice down there. Hey, Gabriel, Michael, come look at this here. <sighs> kind of puts things in perspective, doesn't it? You know, Psalm 2 talks about how the Lord sits in heaven and laughs at the vain, vain practices of the heathen down there. It's a pitiful thing, but it just goes to show how far a man will go because he wants to run his own show. I don't want to be God. Therefore, everything is God. Well, we've got to keep moving. Let's go to the next one. Number four, there is no death. The whole reincarnation bag. You know, Satan said that to Eve in the Garden of Eden. You shall not surely die. We don't die. You get recycled. <laughs> You come back in life after life after life. Now, why do we want to believe in reincarnation? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but they all boil down into two basic reasons. Number one, we don't ever want to stand before God and give account of our lives. <laughs> We'd rather think, oh, we get chance after chance after chance till we finally get it right. <laughs> oh, I love that line. Shirley MacLaine puts it that way. She says, well, one lifetime isn't long enough to learn all the lessons we need to learn. So we have to have all these experiences and learn all these lessons in all these different lifetimes until we finally get it right. Get it right. <laughs> get it right. That's the part I can't stand. They're the ones that say, ah, oh, there's no truth. You make up your own truth. You have your own universe. What's true for you? It may not be true for me, but if it's true for you, it may not be true for me. If there is no ultimate truth, then how do you even have a standard by which you can measure when it is you finally get it right? Well, the second reason that people want to believe in reincarnation is because they hope that through many reincarnations they will finally become so perfected that they will evolve upward into godhood. They want to become God, you see. That, there you go. There's the same doctrine again. I want to be God. Let me tell you about the kissing cousin of reincarnation, and that is karma. It's one of the filthiest jokes that Satan ever played on the human race. You know, it flies right in the face of God's grace. The Lord Jesus came to this earth and he died for those sins of yours, those sins of mine. He gave you a way out of your predicament. It's just like Satan to say, no, you have to work it off. And one lifetime isn't long enough. You've got to come back again and again and work it off. It's this whole idea, the immutable law of cause and effect. In other words, if you're a bad person in this life, you're going to be really bad off in this life. You're going to have to suffer in this life to work off all the bad stuff you did in this one. But let's go to the streets of Calcutta and look at all those little children that starve in the gutters by the hundreds and thousands over there. They die of starvation, of exposure, of total neglect. And the people who live in India who have the money and the food and the shelter, they have everything they need to take care of those kids, walk right by them. Don't even do a thing to help them. Why? Because of karma. Oh, oh, they must have done something bad in their prior life. They're just going to have to work it off now. 
That's why in India you have the caste system, the idea that that's your karma. If you are born a beggar, that's your karma. You're meant to be a beggar. A beggar is all you will ever be. You may as well be the best beggar you can be. That's why the parents will often sever the fingers of their children, break their arm, cut off an arm to make their children look more pitiful so people will feel sorry for them so they will be better beggars. And all because of karma. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, already paid the debt for all of your sins. And if you have faith in Him, He will wash your sins away and you can escape the penalty of sin. All right, let's move on to the last one. That's cosmic consciousness. Now, truth is relative. God is impersonal. All is one. There is no death. Cosmic consciousness is the last one. That is the basic belief. Well, it's the practice, actually. Uh, it's an altered state of consciousness. It's a trance state. You can achieve it through drugs, meditation, yoga, hypnosis, biofeedback, sensory deprivation, all kinds of different ways to achieve it. It is basically... You go into a trance, into a relaxed state of mind, and finally you turn your whole being over to an outside force, an outside entity. And this is where all these weird psychic phenomena come from, because your brain is basically, a, it's like a computer. You, your spirit, happens to be the one in charge of that computer working the keyboard, all right? Now, in an altered state of consciousness, you're basically getting up from the keyboard and you're allowing a demon to sit down there. The demon begins to tweak off all the neurons in your brain. He creates entire universes of illusion in your mind. He gives you past life experiences. He gives you whatever you want. If it can convince you that you can believe the five doctrines and buy the idea that you are God, that you have infinite wisdom within yourself. And there are people that believe it today. What did Satan tell Eve? When you eat the fruit, Eve, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that because they did not love the truth, God gave them over to a lie. And we are seeing people believing the most outlandish lies. Why? To preserve their own arrogance their own pride, their own self-will, their own godhood. What's the answer? Hallelujah, it's what I started out with. There's a savior, there's a champion, his name is Jesus. And he already was God. He didn't have to work up to it, he didn't have to reincarnate to get there, he didn't have to earn brownie points to get there, he was God, he is God, he always will be God, but he did the incredible, totally backward thing to our natures, <laughs> he became man. And even worse than that, he put himself at our mercy, because he came to pay off a debt, he came to pay off a sin. But don't you know, don't you know that Satan saw him coming? Remember, Satan went into the arena with Adam. <laughs> Come on, Adam. <laughs> yeah, there's the representative. There's the representative of the whole human race, and I'm going to kill him. I'm going to make him buy into the lie. Come on, Adam, you want to be God? Hey, come on, you want to do your own thing? Have your own way? Huh? Make your own rules. I'll hand it to you, man. You can have it. And Adam went for it. He fell. He stumbled. He got into that thing, and here we all are. Because of that, Jesus came and went into the same arena, and Satan gave him the same lines, and Jesus was our representative again, and who am I glad he won this time? Round 15 of this match was in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where Jesus really began to feel the pain. That's where Satan really began to pour it on, because Jesus was coming right up to the cross. And in his humanity, he began to feel the terror of what was coming upon him. You can see it as he told his disciples, my soul is vexed unto death. Jesus was grappling with the terror and the pain and the agony that he knew he was going to undergo, knowing that all the sin and the degradation and the filth and the horror and the pain of all humanity was going to be dumped upon him, that he was going to suffer every imaginable kind of wound, that he was going to be separated from God, humiliated, mocked, spit upon, beaten. He was afraid 
And he was struggling with this. And I can just see Satan coming after him. Come on, Jesus. Come on. Give it up, won't you? Come on. You don't have to go through this. Look at all those disciples sleeping over there. They don't care about you. You don't care about the human race. Why don't you do something for yourself for a change? Why don't you get up off of your knees? You're God, aren't you? What about the 10,000 angels you could call to get you out of this? You don't need to go through with this thing. Come on. Take care of yourself. Do something for yourself. Make up your own rules. Do your own thing. And Jesus was struggling against that. He had you in mind. He had me in mind. And he stuck it out to the point where he was sweating blood. But he won. He won that victory. And you can see it in the final line of his prayer. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He made a statement. He made a decision. He made a concrete declaration of what he was going to do. And he never failed throughout his ministry. And Satan was rebuffed. I can almost hear Satan say, okay, son of God. All right, son of God, you want to suffer? You've got it. And Jesus went to that cross, and I know that Satan had all the evil of the world behind him, and he unleashed everything he had on the son of God. He paid the ultimate price, and he took it all out of obedience to God. He was a servant. But that's the point. He took it all. And he didn't give it back. Instead of giving it back, he paid it off. Look at it this way. Here's a family on vacation. Oh, they're driving in their car. Sunny day. Windows are rolled down. Breeze is blowing in the car. They're having a good time. This big old black bee comes in the window. Starts buzzing around in the car. And little girl sitting in the back seat, she's allergic to bee stings. If she gets stung, she could die within an hour. Oh, Daddy, it's a bee. It's going to sting me. And the father, he's trying to pull the car over. He's trying to stop. He's trying to catch the bee. It comes around. He gets it up against the windshield. Finally catches it. Gets the bee in his fist. It's in there. And he hangs on. And he waits. For the inevitable. Finally, it happens. Boom. Ah. Let's the bee go. Daddy, daddy, it's going to sting me. No, honey, he's not going to sting you now. Look what I have in my hand. There's the bee stinger in his hand. Look what Jesus has in his hand. Satan's sting. The sting of death. The sting of sin. The sting of degradation. The sting of defeat. Jesus took it all. It's in his hand. When you see that nail scar, realize he took it all. He paid it off. He reduced Satan to a big black bee. And all Satan can do is buzz. And that's the victory that Jesus won for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.